part two. We're transported back to normalcy. Normalcy, I guess, if that's a, using that properly. Um, with regards to uh, Winston back at work, things are normal, so on and so forth. However, he sees the dark haired girl again. Okay. She trips, he instinctively reaches down to help her up, and in doing so, he, she slips him a note. Have, you've all seen this in the movie, right? How long's the wait? Oh, it's about two hours. Oh, really? Here, maybe see what we can do about that, okay? You know what I mean? Grease in the palm, helping him out. Just kind of slips him a little note. He takes it, puts it in his pocket. He's petrified. Petrified to look at it. What could it say? So many things. I know you. I saw you. I'm going to turn you in. You better kill yourself now. It could be so many things. Not the three words that you see on the next page. Or actually the next page after that. On 108. The three words. And these completely caught me off guard the first time I read this book. Now, I'm not so surprised anymore. Go through this a couple dozen times and so on. But I love you. Huh? She loves him. Have they had conversations? No. Have they had prolonged eye contacts? Uh, when they lock eyes, they usually go the other way. She's kind of a stalker to him from what we see. Now with Winston, he fantasizes about her. He lusts and longs after her and towards her and in her area, but he's not following her around. So there is some, some uh, interest going both ways for these individuals. Um, it took him a while to get up the nerve to, to talk to her, to figure it out, to reciprocate. Not necessarily, I love you back, but to have a conversation because, remember, the party doesn't want promiscuity or affection between two people. And so they have to covertly figure things out. And he worries that, you know, above all that, I'm taking too long. She's going to change her mind. This hot little thing that I've had a thing for, she's going to change her mind. I've got to figure out a way to get in the near vicinity. You know, we, maybe I'll sit with her at lunch. Oh, well, that didn't quite work out the way we wanted it to. But ultimately, ultimately, that if you jump to, well, 114 and 15 where we did our write-up. They find and make their way out to Victory Square. Remember the term victory, victory gin, victory cigarettes, victory square. Okay, that whole propaganda machine that's going on. And there is a parade of POWs going by. So the enemies. So in this instance, it's the Eurasians being carted by. And everybody you can imagine, big brother this, big brother that, Eurasia, you're this, you're that. And it's like a big mosh pit. And they're so close together, like this, that they can talk without really moving their arms. Yeah, they can still do this so they can talk and without drawing attention. Because you see how I'm not really moving my lips too much? But yet I can convey with her and converse with her as to what we need to do. And there's so much noise. You don't have to worry about telescreens picking them up. Okay? They figure out, she gives them some direction, they figure out a place to meet up. And that's what happens in chapter 2. Um, they can't write anything down, all these things, so she tells it to him. He goes, yeah, I can make it there. Yeah, I know that. Uh-huh. And so they say, okay, well, get away from me. And so they're expecting to break apart and move, but you're stuck in the middle of a mosh pit. You ain't going nowhere. So they're stuck. What does she do while they stand there and wait? Did you pick up on it? It was very... Sh she went and held his hand. Imagine standing next to each other and just, I mean, it's probably nothing more than maybe a touch. Maybe this. Right? But that first time you hold hands with somebody that you like, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, that's a big deal. That connection, that, that bond is starting. And so they held hands like that for whatever, I don't even know if it told you, for not long. And then they went their own way and then they met up in chapter 2. Okay? Um, chapter 2. Part 2, chapter 2. He makes his way out to the country. The trains, the streets, walking around. Even out in the country, 
Even if you don't find some telescreens mounted on walls, there's still the possibility of being spied on. Okay? Um, you remember The Incredibles, right? When they land on that island, on Syndrome's Island, and the kids are running out by themselves like, oh, look at that birdie. Well, the birdie is what? It turns out to be an alarm. Its head pops up and it just starts squawking and squeaking and then all these cameras come on and, you know, and focus on the kids and that's how we find out that, you know, the bad guy finds out that, you know, Dash and Violet are there. Um, so anyways, um, you never know. You never know with these, uh, with, with the country, how you are truly safe or, you know, the best you can do is hope, I guess, and be overly cautious and protective. And they do that and they eventually uh, do meet up uh, with each other. Um, page 120. We find out a lot about this girl. Do we find out her name yet? It's on 122. We find out her name's Julia. Okay, the dark haired girl's name is Julia. So we have Winston and Julia. Um, Winston is very honest right on 120. I'm 39, I've got a wife that I can't get rid of. I've got varicose veins and I've got five false teeth. I could care less. She doesn't care. Doesn't care. The next moment she's in his arms. This young thing, and he's an older guy, and just she's so beautiful, and everything's great, and things just aren't really clicking for him. It's a little too much too soon. If you kind of see where we're going with this in a in a nice way, school appropriate way, okay? Things just aren't working at this particular time, um, and so she goes, "That's all right, we have time." So they sit around and talk, okay? They sit around and talk for a little bit. Never mind, dear. There's no hurry. You know what? He said, "I hated you. I hated the sight of you." I wanted to rape you and then murder you afterwards. I was going to bash in your head. I was going to get you. And she thought that that was funny. The girl laughed delightedly. <laughs> and she goes, why? And they discuss. Well, it's, she goes, it's this thing, isn't it? And it's that sash. Remember that uh, the junior anti-sex league sash that she wears? And he talks about in here that it just nicely shapes her curves and accentuates her curves. She goes, it's this thing. She goes, that's my cover. I go to the two minutes hates, I'm in this anti-sex league, this is on my cover so that I can go and do these things. Because when they finally get it going and get it on, he says, how many times have you done this before? Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds. What? Remember, he just wanted one time in his life, and he's, he's getting it, but he wanted one time in his life that could be just desire and this, this rebellious act. And she's done this thing a hundred, hundreds of times and so on. Um, he told her, I thought you were a thought police, and she goes, no, 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 no. Um, I play the games. I play the games so that I can have my little fun off on the side without drawing focus. Okay? You've all seen that before. Criminals have a double life, right? Um, the TV show Breaking Bad. If anybody's watching that. No? Yes? One of the head drug dealers in there is a, uh, in charge of a chicken uh, like a KFC type franchise. That's his cover. Extremely good cover. He donates to the police. He donates to hospitals. He's on board of directors in all of these areas. You think that's a good cover? Make good friends with the cops and somebody, if they ever say, I think that guy's dirty. He donates to our fundraisers. What are you talking about? That's a great cover. Okay, so her cover, oh yeah, she's promiscuous. She's one of the main people of the Junior Anti-Sex League. She is not sleeping around. Okay, so that's playing the games um, that she's talking about. Um, page 122 is something very interesting. He says, you are very young. He said, you are 10 or 15 years younger than I am. What could you see to attract you in a man like me? They both know why he's attracted to her. She's young and very attractive. But he knows I'm really not a catch. Why are you attracted to me? Why did you say you loved me before we even talked or spoke at all? She goes, there was something in your face. I thought I'd take a chance. I'm good at spotting people who don't belong. As soon as I saw you, I knew you were against them. That's a very telling statement. If I'm Winston in this world of paranoia, she just said, I could tell from looking at you that you don't belong, that you're against them. Would that make him feel good or more paranoid? I would think way more apparent. If she noticed it, who else? I'm thinking I'm doing a good job. But she said, first glance, she knew that I'm against them. 
What would these other people, what would Big Brother and everybody else? Anybody else. Sime, Parsons, Mr. Charrington, O'Brien, Big Brother himself. Maybe it's easy for the Rebellion and Goldstein to find him in the long run. Maybe it's a big sign on his face that says, Hey, I'm not with the party, but I am. So I'm not. Back and forth. Um, but that's very, very interesting. Uh, he talks about the golden country, his dream. She rips off her clothes and chucks them aside just like her dream. And what do you mean the gold country? Oh, it's part of my dream. So we see him... I don't know if it's he's psychic or what, but this, his mental images are happening and they're turning out like he thought. Um, so keep that in mind with regards to, well, if those dreams are coming true, it's like Macbeth, right? If those prophecies come true, well, then maybe these prophecies will come true, that type of thing. So keep an eye on that. Um, page 125. When she says that she's been with a, well, you know, she's had sex hundreds of times, well, scores of times anyway, with party members, yes, always party members, because that's the rule of the party is no two members are, are, if you need to, you know, you need to go and have sex, you go do it with a prostitute or some proles. Two, you know, two party members are not supposed to get together. That's not how it happens. But yes, all of them have been within party members, have been with party members, with members of the inner party. Not with those swine, no. But there's plenty that would if they, ha if they got half a chance. They're not so holy as they make out. Pay attention to his reaction. His heart leapt out. Scores of times she had done it. He wished it had been hundreds, thousands. Anything that hinted at corruption always filled him with a wild hope. Listen, the more men you've had, the more I love you. Do you understand that? Yes, perfectly. I hate purity. I hate goodness. Because if she's had sex with a thousand different party members, that means a thousand different party members are not as goody-goody as what Big Brother is saying the party members are. So Winston is not necessarily as alone. You see how that's a positive? Okay? Because in a relationship in our society, you typically don't want your partner to be that, have that kind of a record. Typically. That's why it's so what in here. Okay. Um, so it's, very, it's a very interesting moment and very telling moment in their relationship that they are both going uh, for the corruption and, and for the, um, you know, this is their way of getting back at Big Brother and so on. And the last page on page 126. Um, and at the end of that, that, that was above all what he wanted to hear. Not merely the love of one person, but the animal instinct. The simple, undifferentiated desire that was the force that would tear the party to pieces. And at the end, in the old days, he thought a man looked at a girl's body and saw that it was desirable. And that was the end of the story. But you could not have pure love or pure lust nowadays. No emotion was pure because everything was mixed up with fear and hatred. Their embrace had been a battle, the climax of victory. It was a blow struck against the party. It was a political act. Remember, he was talking about he wants that moment of desire because that's thought crime. He wants those moments because it is an act of rebellion. And that's the only safe one that he kind of has at this moment. When he was uh, having um, relations with her, you know, she was so open and loving and touching and they got into it completely opposite of his time with his wife. Do you remember the description? Her eyes were closed and, you know, she was just going through the motions, I guess you could say. Um, that's her duty for the party, it said. Julia is not doing this for the party. She's doing it for herself. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, part two uh, part one was the exposition, the setup of Winston, a big brother of how everything goes, the paranoia, the establishment of all that. Part two deals with Winston and Julia, their relationship that's budding. Okay, they're going to have to be very careful, those of you that have read ahead. They need to pick their times and moments they get together very, very carefully. Okay, 126, 127. 
Very interesting uh, things transpire. As I told you, part one of the book is really dealing with the exposition of the play, not play, of the story, uh, you know, setting up everything you need to know. So really part two is dealing with Winston and Julia. And it's kind of like their honeymoon phase right now, okay? In the first chapter, she slips on the note, I love you, that blows his mind. Second chapter, they go in the meadow and have political acts, right? <laughs> That's what it says. It was a political act. Clever. Um, and so anyways, uh, they go, uh, now it's dealing with uh, the present day, you know, back into culture, society. Uh, remember, party members are not supposed to get together, and so they have to act normal. Um, you see this in the news, not, well, it's not really news, um, celebrities, you know, who don't want to know that they're dating other celebrities or whatever, they're very coy about it. Uh, some of them, will, they'll arrive separately and sit in the VIP section, then one person will leave early, you know what I mean, that type of thing. Um, imagine you had a locker partner or a really good, you know, a, a person next to you in here. You have classes with them, next to them out there. You're actually dating, but you don't want anybody to know. That'd be kind of stressful, and you do certain things to make sure that, you know, things were getting picked up, you know, the vibe and stuff. But imagine now in Big Brother's culture, the paranoia. Look at what she does on the bottom of 127. If she judged that the coast was clear, she'd blow her nose when he approached. Otherwise... He was to walk past her without recognition. They thought about this. It's like in sports, like uh, baseball. Huge baseball fan. Anybody watch the World Series? Unbelievable game last night. That was the best World Series game I've ever seen. Anyways, um, a baseball coach. They do this stuff. They do this, this. What does it mean? It means absolutely nothing until he hits what they call an indicator. That changes, and that's what it might rotate. It might be, you know, his temple. So all of this is junk. The batter, the runner's like, okay, I'm not paying attention. Wait for him to touch his eye. Wait for him to touch his eye. The next thing I touch is the sign, whether it's bunt or steel or slot, you know, just different things. Um, when I was in high school, uh, when I wasn't pitching, I would sit next to the coach and I'd try to pick up the signs. He's going to bunt. How do you know? Well, that's, I figured out the indicator. So I would try to steal signs and just process elimination, trying to figure out, well, I would bunt in this situation, paying attention to the signs. Then the next time, try to figure it out. It's kind of like reading a player in cards, that type of thing. But I always enjoy doing that. Um, anyway, so she has her little signs. Okay, as they're walking close, she'll sneeze if it's cool. Otherwise, just go. Keep going. Don't draw attention or focus. Okay. Um, Winston doesn't really think they're going to get away with it, does he? From the beginning, he said he's going to get caught. It's inevitable. They're going to get you now. They're going to get you months down the road, years down the road. It happens. You can't do anything about it. He shares that with her. He says, we are dead. Right? Her response, not yet. Okay? The big thing that we have in these two, three chapters, or the main focus, um, they have a lot of dialogue back and forth. We find out a lot of things about Julia, mostly... Up until now, it was she has dark hair and likes overalls, and he's attracted to her. That's it. Here we find out more about her personality. We find out what she thinks or what she doesn't think, how they do not necessarily agree on certain things. Okay, you want, you, they make it early on seem like, oh, we're just perfect for each other. This is awesome, heavenly. But really, there's a gap. It's like when you see on the news, uh, you know, an 80-year-old man is marrying a 25-year-old girl. You're like... Great, sure. Oh, we're soulmates. Sure you are. Of course. Of course. I guarantee they probably struggle for conversation. You know what I mean? He was alive for Kennedy. He was alive for space landing, Woodstock, all of these things. Maybe a war veteran. She experienced the first round of Melrose Place in the 90s. You know what I mean? I'm sure, unless she's just crazy educated, and of course this goes back and forth, you know, there's Demi and Ashton, you know, that type of thing. But you have these individuals that, can you really have an intellectual conversation? If she's crazy smart, he's crazy smart, sure. Okay? But we see a 15-year gap, roughly. I think that's what he says. I'm 39, 14, 15 years older, I think is what he says. Um, and we see that gap. She wasn't around. 
in the 50s and 60s. She wasn't there for the purges. She doesn't know anything other than Big Brother. Okay? That's important to understand. And he deals with that frustration. He goes into, and we'll find the page in a little bit, but he struggles trying to make her understand. It's like if I'm talking to somebody and I'm opinionated and you're opinionated. And I'm, as a teacher, I'm trying to get you to understand, no, I'm right. I'm, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. But you're like, no, no, this is it. This is it. No, but you're wrong. You've got to open your mind a little bit more. That type of thing. And so he's very, very frustrated. And you can see um, there's just kind of a little gap. They're not breaking up. This isn't a honeymoon's over type of thing. It's just them trying to learn a little bit about each other. And he's not really learning that, wow, we aren't intellectually synced, with, synced up with each other. We still practice political acts, but we aren't together. Okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, page 132. Winston shares with her about his wife, Catherine, and about how, you know, their lovemaking, how it was uh, not very enjoyable, and how she would act a certain way, and how she called it. Julia jumps in, oh, our duty to the party. How did you know? Honey, I went to school too. That's how they were being indoctrinated. That was, you know, you guys have health class here. You've had health class, probably some variation of health class in middle school. Okay, and not necessarily health class in elementary, but they taught you some basics. Imagine 1984 ladies being pushed in your head. It's not pleasurable. It's not fun. It's not this. It's your duty for the party. And if you grow up as a junior spy, you probably don't have to go too far to actually accept what they tell you. Your purpose is to serve the party. And so to be a spy, and all of a sudden, you're like, no, you're not supposed to have sex. You're not supposed to do any of these things. They start learning that stuff. Now, some of them, obviously, Go, okay, yeah, yep, yeah, okay, no sex, got it, got it, and then they go and do it. As she says in here, you can break, you know, you've got to keep the little rules, keep the little rules, keep, follow, 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 do, keep your cover. We talked about keeping cover in here. Keep your cover so that you can go and do this stuff on the side. Because if somebody ever questions her, they're like, oh, yeah, Julia's sleeping with this person, this person. Wait a minute, Julia? Anti-sex league, Julia, who does these fundraisers, who does all of these things? Uh, no. Doubt it. Okay? Um, so that's part of the cover, and that's important because she plays these games in order to get away with it. We find out that she doesn't agree with the, uh, with the philosophies of, um, of Big Brother necessarily, but she's not going to do anything about it. Winston wants to do something about it. Yes, he's doing his political act, but that was his rebellion. That was the only way he could rebel early on. He said, I just want to have one of those moments. One of those moments of desire, since that was a thought come, I just want one time. And he's having more more time, as we see throughout this uh, part two. Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. So in talking about his wife, um, he mentions a story about how they were at the top of a cliff, and they were looking over, and he had this idea to push her. He likes to have these violent thoughts, doesn't he? I mean, this is his wife. Remember what he wanted to do to Julia before he knew her name? All of those violent, violent things, okay? Well, he didn't know her. That's different. Oh, okay. is it? He's married to this woman. Now, marriage there is not the same as our marriage, right? Okay, but in title, that's his wife he wanted to push off. What good would that have done is what he says. I, I didn't do it, I, just like he didn't do anything to Julia, okay? Um, but what's the point? What's the point? We're still going to get, you know, oppressed and have all of these things, and life is still not going to be great. What, what is that going to solve? How is that going to make my life better by pushing her off? It's not. And we see their marriage dissolved uh, earlier on, I believe it was, um, so when they decided they couldn't have kids or it wasn't working for whatever reason. Well, we're not. That's the only reason we're together. Let's separate. Okay. Um, very top of 136. We're not dead yet. Well, not physically, but six months, a year, five years, oh, I'm afraid of death. You're young. You're blah, blah, blah. So long as human beings stay human, death and life are the same thing. Oh, rubbish. Which would you sooner sleep with, me or a skeleton? I think everybody knows the answer to that because we don't want to be gross and skeletons and stuff. I'm alive. Feel me. Touch me. I'm alive. I'm not dead yet. Don't live like you're a corpse. 
You want to be with me or a dead thing? Me, because I'm alive, you're alive. And so we see the back and forth about um, uh, you know, the future. And Winston, don't we want our heroes to be more optimistic and positive? Right? Not so, hey, this is great, we're having fun, but we're, gonna, we're, we're dead. They're going to get us. We'll still have fun and we'll see how much damage we can do before then, but they're going to get us. He said that from the beginning, but she doesn't want to hear it. She doesn't contradict him, doesn't make him change his statement. She doesn't try to convince him otherwise. She just says, stop whining, Winston. Just stop it. And we will have fun and enjoy our political acts. Um, chapter 5, 137. What's that? Four, excuse me. Yes, four. We'll edit that out. So we go. Cut. Chapter four. Page 137. Um, these next couple chapters, some more intrigue uh, and discussion between the two uh, leads. We find out more information about Mr. Charrington. Um, we find out Winston's real inner thoughts and feelings pertaining to the apartment, which is vital. Okay? Um, I'm not sure if it's happened yet, but there's going to be a metaphor put in play that compares uh, you know, Winston to that coral. Now, if Winston is the coral, then what is the glass in the real world? Winston is the coral that's encased in glass, right? The glass protects Shields, shelters the coral from Big Brother. So Winston is the coral. What's the glass? The apartment. He is protected. There's no telescreens. There's no Big Brother. They're in Prole District. Everything is safe. Okay? So you can see how that paperweight, how he's so infatuated with that piece of coral in that, in that glass paperweight, and how he might feel like, gosh, I'm, I feel like this. I'm protected. I'm safe. Okay? And so that metaphor there will come into play later on. Uh, so keep up on that. Um, they struggle in these couple chapters. Uh, they're getting ready for hate week. Um, not the two minutes hate. Hate week. Okay? And you'll see that a whole week where they focus on hate. And you'll see what that talks about. Uh, I think that's in this weekend's homework. Uh, so, you'll, so you'll read that. Um, but they struggle to, to find time to connect. You know, and so there's all that frustration. So when they get together, they feel like they have to do their thing. Um, and Winston, at one point, I mean, he enjoys it and all, but he wants a little bit more. He doesn't want to always feel pressured in order to do that. Okay? Uh, he wants to, uh, you know, have a real relationship. Okay? Um, these next couple pages, 141, 2, 3, it's kind of neat. It's kind of like two kids playing house. Okay? She smuggles in some contraband. Like how people smuggle and stuff to jail. She brings in some, some coffee. Not just coffee, but inner party coffee. Not just tea, but good tea. She has some scents, lilac smell, some things to help. She paints her face. Ladies, what is that? Makeup. Good job. Good job. No. It's obvious, I think. Um, but they, she paints her face. Do you think she does it delicately, delicately and nicely? No. Imagine a four-year-old getting into mom's or dad's uh, makeup. What? I have makeup. I'm an actor, so I have my stage makeup. But so if the kids get in it, they might do certain things. Now imagine just this, maybe somebody that seizuring up or something, palsy. Just, just, it's not like clown makeup. It's just all over. No. So clown makeup all over, you know, it's just, it's just a mess. But yet it looks really beautiful because these party members do not wear makeup at all. Okay, so she's trying to beautify this situation, this house, house, and they're having a, having a nice time. She takes off her overalls and puts on a dress. It's like, the, yeah, it's a big deal. So it's kind of like, this is what married life is supposed to be like. This is what... Life, maybe in Prole District, is semi-like. Semi in my mind, I'm thinking this is what life would be like outside of Big Brother. Okay, and they really enjoy it. And so they, they get very comfortable, very comfortable, until Winston uh, finds an animal in the room. Did you pick up on that? 
Okay? These are moments that annotations, it should go ding, I should highlight, I should write something down. Anytime we find out something new, we find out a lot of new stuff about Julia in the, this section, right? Tons of stuff about Julia, about what she believes. She's not just the brunette in overalls. We find out much, much more about what she believes, what motivates her, what pushes her, okay? But here, we find out about Winston that he's scared of rats, petrified of rats. Um, oh, a rat, I saw him stick his nose out. Oh, rats in this room? Ah, oh, they're all over the place, blah, 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 blah. Don't go on, said Winston with his eyes tightly shut. Dearest, you've gone quite pale. What's the matter? Do they make you feel sick? Of all the horrors in the world, a rat. Of all the horrors in the world, a rat. A couple stories. I have a cousin down in Florida. She was off the beach with her four, five, six year old. They were splashing around in the water a couple feet deep, and the shark comes swimming right by. What does a good mother do? Get her kid out of the water, right? My cousin pushes her kid out of the way and runs to the beach. <laughs> am, I, am, I a, am I a bad mom? Bob? Yes. You're horrible. You're the worst mom in the world. But think about it from her point of view. Her first thought, shark, I'm in the water. I need to get out of the water. Fear, right? Fear shuts down all reason. And she, boom, OK? Uh, we moved into a house last year. And we, uh, I inherited a, an in-ground pool. And so that's a lot of maintenance. Um, but I cleaned out the sifter box, you know, where we, the, the leaves and stuff. So I go into the deep end and lift up the thing, and there's a little mole or mouse or something just kind of dead, floating there, rigor mortis and all that. Um, so I left it there, and I thought, what can I do? How can I have fun? When I used to, before I was a teacher, I worked third shift for a few years while I was going to school, going back to school to be a teacher. And I, uh, I worked third shift. So I'd sleep at, you know, during the day or at night. My wife would wake me up every once in a while. There's a spider downstairs. Kill it. No. Oh. She won't even go into the room. So I have to get up, go kill it. Thank you, I'm whatever. I go back to bed. So I like, I like, to, I like, I like to surprise people. So here's another example of where fear shuts you down. Because Winston, he shuts down. He starts screaming and shrieking like, Something, okay? That's more emotion than we've seen from him this entire time. If you're watching this on play, a uh, play or a movie, he would be so even all of the time, so paranoid, but then just shrieking and going nuts. So, anyways, uh, outside our back, uh, back, the, the sliding doors. We have a deck. You walk down the deck, down a couple steps, and then the pool and the deep ends over there, and that's where the sifter is. And so I said, honey, can you go get that? I have to, I don't know, maybe go to the bathroom or something. She goes, okay. I said, I, I think I forgot one. Can you just check it while you close the pool down? And so she walked out, and I watched her. And she had my daughter with her. I'm like, score. It's going to get both of them. And so she opened it up, and she screamed, spun, and ran all the way around the pool, all the way up the deck, all the way in the house. And she was still doing this. I'm like, really? Wouldn't you just, like, ah, oh, that's. That's, you scared me. But no, she ran all the way and she was, and my daughter's traipsing after her, being left behind. Um, so that's always, that's always a fun thing. Exactly, what's it going to do? It's not going to jump out, but just the, it, it's there, you know. So I understand it's gross, disease, dead and all that. What's that? I don't know. I don't think I have anything that I would shut down. I like to scuba dive. I went to Australia. I got scuba dive certified for that. I wanted to see a shark. I didn't see a shark. <laughs> so um, yeah, I was a little disappointed. But it was still the Great Barrier Reef, and that was pretty cool. Um, anyways, back to this. He shuts down. That's something to keep an eye on. That's so much more emotion than we've ever seen of him. Anytime you have a brand new, not, not a brand new character, excuse me, a brand new emotion, a brand new observation of a pre-existing character, keep note of that, because that shows the evolution of that person. And we see him in a whole different light here in this particular room. <laughs> Chapter 5, page 147, very first line, Syme has vanished. Syme has vanished. Were you surprised? Well, Winston told us. Winston, 
Yeah, I kind of smile in this chapter. Sign vanished. I'm like, huh, of course he did. Know it all. Goody two shoes. You know, like I actually know the guy. Um, but just based on that, you know, Syme had ceased to exist. He had never existed. That doesn't blow your mind anymore, does it? The fact that they can do that blows your mind, but the fact that Syme, Syme never existed. There's no proof Syme ever walked this earth. If I start to question that, I'm like, well, let me look up the old time cards, the old punch cards, the old work schedule. I have to go back into some records. Well, who controls the records? Big Brother. Okay, and so Syme never existed at all, and you got to keep that keep that in your mind. Um, bottom of 150. Back in the uh, there, here's another one of those observational moments that are is very interesting, I think, um, because Winston just kind of observes Mr. Charrington walking around his shop. Okay, and he says he walks around and he fiddles around with all of his stuff, just kind of like in mild amusement, just. Moving it around, just like you're a collector, not really like you're there to sell it. Do you understand the difference? Because Winston's staying there. He goes there a lot. Hey, you want to try this? You don't have one of those? Oh, you have one of those? Well, then buy this one. Oh, you should see this. This is awesome. You like that coral? You're going to love this? That would be selling, right? But he doesn't do that. He just kind of seems to... Walk around and look at stuff. Look at that, bottom of 150. Wandering around his worthless stock with his long nose and thick spectacles and his bowed shoulders and the velvet jacket, he had always vaguely the air of being a collector rather than a tradesman. With a sort of faded enthusiasm, he would finger this scrap of rubbish or that, never asking that Winston should buy it, merely that he should admire it. Now, I told you the exposition was predominantly thrown in the first part. The second part is more about characters and finding out new things. We found out a lot about Julia. Winston, well, we learn more about what he thinks and, and the emotion behind it, but we even find out more about Mr. Charrington, a semi, uh, I thought, first time reading it, we see him once, and not, not at all, so we see him again. Um, and he sometimes stops and talks to him. 151, the room itself was a sanctuary, and that's where we, you gotta think about Winston thinking that he's like that coral. And this room is just, ah. Uh, Maybe you have a room at home. Maybe it's your basement. Okay, Mine, I'm still getting used to my house after a year, so the basement doesn't have the feeling in my other place. But I used to go to the basement, just sit in my chair and turn on the ball game, and I could just go, just relax. You ever had one of those moments? Is there a place that you can just, you just feel comfortable. You just feel protected and safe. And that's what Winston feels like with this room. Um, We see more about her opinions, 153. I kind of alluded to this previously, where he's talking about, excuse me, where is it at? Oh, she gives her opinion, excuse me, she, it, right in the middle. In her opinion, the war was not even happening. The rocket bombs that fell daily on London were probably fired by the government of Oceania itself, just to keep people frightened. During the two minutes, her great difficulty was to avoid bursting out in laughter. So even though she goes through everything, okay, her two minutes of hate is more like, look how stupid they are. <laughs> you know, just laughing and mocking. This is what we probably call a conspiracy theorist. You know, there are conspiracies pertaining to uh, whether America had a hand in 9-11. Have you heard this one? Yeah. Okay, those are conspiracy things where maybe there's some proof Maybe there's not. It just seems to be a radical notion. This is a, Winston's like, what are you talking about? She's like, oh, yeah, those bombs? We're doing that to ourselves to keep people in line, to keep people frightened. He doesn't quite agree with that. And that's where we really get to see them going back and forth about what they truly believe pertaining to the party. The bottom of 154, uh, then sp spreading around at 155, he tried to make her understand. Do you realize that the past, starting from yesterday, has been actually abolished? Every record has been destroyed or falsified. History has stopped. Doesn't that bother you? She's like, oh. He goes, no, 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 no. The only evidence is inside my own mind. And I don't know with any certainty that any other human being shares my memories. Just in that one instance in my whole life, I did possess actual concrete evidence 
after the event, which was what? The picture. The picture. Oh, yeah? Well, what good did it do you? <sighs> Who cared? What, what, did the world change because you had your evidence? What happened? Well, no, nothing happened because I incinerated it. But if it happened now, I know I would keep it and I would do something about it. Well, I wouldn't, said Julia. I'm quite ready to take risks, but only for something worthwhile. She doesn't seem to fully grasp what's going on, the level of deception that's happening. She's content with simply, really, her own, what's her main deal? What's her main rebellion? Having sex. And she's fine with that, the political ex, that's right. What does he call her on the next page? You're just a rebel below the waist. Most rebels are rebels up here, right? You fully believe against or in opposition of what is the ruling majority and so on. Um, but you're just a rebel waist down. You're just, you're just, whatever. And so we can see that they are two distinctly different people, okay? Are they breaking up? No. They're still doing their thing, okay? But we are identifying the fact that they do not believe the same thing. Winston is in it for something completely different. He thinks that you need to do all of these things, these risks, in order to make a, make a point. She goes, oh, I'm not going to risk that. I've, just, I've worked too hard to get my, my cover story. I'm, I'm fine with what I'm doing. And so we see a big difference. So character shifts in, uh, in these reading chapters are, are immense. Okay, so keep up with that. Um, chapter 6. 157 and so on. Winston actually gets to speak with O'Brien, the high-ranking inter, inter party member. I think the first time he mentions O'Brien, he says, I've seen him maybe a dozen times over the last countless years. So it's not like I see him every year or every day. He's my boss. It's routine. Bumps into him every once in a while. And it's not like I talk to him. They haven't talked or spoken. Winston believes that they shared a glance after that initial two-minute hate. Can you remember that? And he, even O'Brien is the one Winston is writing for. And he's had dreams about O'Brien, where O'Brien talks to him and says, we will meet again in the place where there is no darkness. Okay? All of these things and elements, that's before we, the reader, have ever heard O'Brien open his mouth outside of screaming at the telescreen. Okay? Um, so we see on 157, 158, uh, the 10th edition. I have the 10th edition. It's not due to appear for some months, I believe, but a few advanced copies. It's kind of like saying, you know what, I have the, how many Harry Potter books are there? Seven. Seven. I actually am in possession of the 8th Potter book right now. Do you want to come over and see it? If I liked Harry Potter, I'd be like, uh, yes. Remember what Syme was working on? What edition? 10. 11th. 11th edition, right? The 10th hasn't even come out yet, and they're already working on the next one. Okay? But he says, hey, and the telescreen's always up here. O'Brien puts his back to the telescreen on a piece of paper, writes out his address. Why don't you come over sometime? I'll let you take a look at it. Okay? And so we have um, O'Brien doing something out of the view of the telescreen. You think that makes Winston feel pretty good? Probably a little bit. Because they've never spoken directly about the Brotherhood, Goldstein, their discomfort about the whole thing. It was just a glance, a parting, quick, I look, and then I move on. That was it. Okay? Um, and so this makes him, makes him feel good. Um, bottom of 159, that last paragraph, I like this paragraph. Because Winston, as we already talked about, he's not very optimistic about things. He knows that the end, he says that the end is coming. I will end up in the ministry of, uh, was it peace? Life, love, love, of course. Ministry of love. Um, he knew that sooner or later he would ob obey O'Brien's summons, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps after a long delay. He was not certain. What was happening was only the working out of a process that had started years ago. The first step had been a secret, involuntary thought. The second had been the opening of the diary. He had moved from thoughts to words and now from words to action. Political acts. The last step was something that would happen in the ministry of love. He had accepted it. The end 
was contained in the beginning. So the moment he started on this path, and really it was a path that he couldn't even control because the first thought was a subconscious thought that happened. But he knows that it's going to end there. He just, it, he's seen it. He knows what's going on. Okay, that's why he was saying earlier, we are dead. What, first chapter in the whole book? Didn't he say, you know, they're going to get me? I know they're going to come and get me at nine and put a bolt in the back of my head? Not a very positive outlook and so on. Okay? Part two, chapter seven. These three chapters for today are very, very different, but very, very uh, informative, uh, you know, for us as the reader, you know, along this journey of 1984. Um, we see a lot of his dreams, um, you know, coming to terms with accepting them, like with his mom in this first one. Um, but then also, when we meet O'Brien later, the dream about the statement of, in a place where there is no darkness, and O'Brien's like, yeah, in a place where there is no darkness, right. And so things come about and come true uh, from, you know, his dreams earlier on in the book. Do you recall the golden country dream that he had with Julia before we knew her name was Julia? That pretty much came down perfectly, you know, happened the way that, you know, he, he foresaw it, foretold, um, predicted, and so on. Um, page 160, he wakes up from a dream. Something had triggered in his mind, in his subconscious, and it was the, remember the movie, the film, the news footage from the very beginning with all of the people cheering because the babies and the kids were being blown up? And there was the woman, and he called her a Jewess. The way she put her arm around the kid as if to protect him from bullets, like that would do it. But he mentions here on the left-hand side of um, 160 that that motion, that movement, that protective movement triggered something in his mind. Not right then, but something else later on came to him through a dream. And you see it here. It, it makes a connection to his mom. And he's had these thoughts about his mom, and, and he has a lot of guilt about what happened with his mom. He always thought up until this moment that he was responsible for her disappearance. He thought he had, in essence, murdered her. Maybe in the way that you know a, a junior spy turns in a parent may or could have some sort of guilt with regards to that. We don't know. And we still don't know what happened to the dad. Okay, We can guess what happens, and so on, and there's a description on the next page, and so on, uh, but it says that the dad had disappeared. He doesn't really remember him being around. It was mostly the mom, Winston, and then his, his infant, young, young, um, you know, uh, I almost said daughter, um, his sister, okay? Um, page 161, he goes into detail about these, these remembrances, it's like if you have amnesia and then things start slowly coming back to your memory. And he remembers what it was like when he was younger and how there was never enough to eat. Always digging through garbage and trash, waiting for the grain truck to drive by with cattle feed and then hit a pothole and then it would shake some loose then you could get some. Okay, He remembers that. He remembers his dad not being around. When his father disappeared, his mother did not show any surprise or any violent grief, but a sudden change came over her. She seemed to have become completely spiritless. It was evident, even to Winston, that she was waiting for something that she knew must happen. She did everything much slower. Sometimes she would hold on to her, her, her daughter and not say anything. And just sometimes she'd grab onto Winston and just hold him close. And maybe that's where that protective arm kind of remembers, you know, uh, helped trigger his memory. Okay? It's almost like she's waiting for something to happen. And that's where I think maybe this places it right in the middle of those purges that he was talking about. You remember those? Okay? The purges. It's like if I ask you to purge your H drive, you select everything and delete it. You just cleaned it out. You purge. You got rid of everything. If you saw the new Tron movie, Tron Legacy, they purged all those ISOs when Clue took over. If you remember what I'm talking about. If not, that probably means nothing to you. But to purge, annihilate, get rid of. Um, on uh, 162, 162, Winston goes into some um, memories about eating, about how his mom would ladle him food and he would cry and throw a fit. Not that he had to eat, but that she stopped ladling. I want more food. I'm hungry. I want more food. 
Don't be greedy. We need to feed everybody. Don't be greedy. And so that's all she would you know, say to him. Focus. Knock it off. Okay, the main essence of this chapter involved chocolate. Okay, he wanted the whole piece of chocolate. She goes, no, we're going to break it in half for your sister and for you. He threw a fit about it. It said that they went round and round and round. And ultimately, really to shut him up, she broke it three quarters of it to you, Winston, a quarter of it to your sister. He downed it. The child still holds on to it. He reaches over, grabs it, and runs away. And the mom screams after him, Winston, Winston, Winston. You can all envision this, right? Those of you that have brothers or sisters or skirmishes within the house, you all know this. Might not be over chocolate, but something similar. So he takes off. And it's through sudden guilt. And like, ah, oh, that's horrible. I'm bad. So he went back home. She's gone. Sister's gone. Nothing else in the room has been touched or changed. Just them. Okay? Now what happened to her? He doesn't even know at this point. Okay, was she purged off and killed? Was she sent off to some, some uh, prison? Some, remember the hard labor camp that he was going to be sent to, potentially, for uh, that opening the diary? It's not illegal. There's no, you know, nothing's illegal. Just, I'd probably be executed or sent to prison. Doesn't make sense to me. Um, the, the daughter, the, 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 his sister, maybe sent off to some unwanted kid's home, some orphanage, like how Winston was. He doesn't know for sure, but he knows that he didn't murder. He wasn't responsible for her death, Okay, which is huge because he's had all of this guilt um, forever. And he says that he never saw his mom again. When he came back, she had disappeared. Everything was the same except for his sister and so on. Um, page 165. So Winston and Julie are having some more of their, their in-depth conversations. And this is one of their last uh, really in-depth ones. Um, but ultimately, Winston says that uh, whatever happened, you vanished. And neither you nor your actions were ever heard of again. You were lifted clean out of the stream of history, which is a kind of, imagine a floating stream going by and you're just, you're in, it's history. They just kind of pluck you out of it. You don't belong there anymore. And then you cease to exist and you're done. Um, what mattered were individual relationships and a completely helpless gesture, an embrace, a tear, a word spoken to a dying man could have value in itself. The proles. It suddenly occurred to him, had remained in this condition. All party members are robots, emotionless robots. They have no, no feelings, none of this other stuff. But the proles are still human beings. They'd remained in this condition. They were not loyal to a party or a country or any idea. They were loyal to one another. For the first time in his life, he did not despise the proles or think of them merely as an inert force which would one day spring to life and regenerate the world. The proles had stayed human. They had not become hardened inside. And so we have a new respect for the proles that we didn't have at all. They were the lowest rung. But now Winston's saying, even though they're down, those are the true humans. And he's almost envious of those humans and so on. The proles are human beings. We are not human. Why not? He thought for a little while. Has it ever occurred to you that the best thing for us to do would be simply to walk out of here before it's too late and never see each other again? Yes, dear, it's occurred to me several times, but I'm not going to do it all the same. We've been lucky, but it can't last much longer. You're young. You look normal and innocent. If you keep clear of people like me, you might stay alive for another 50 years. No, I've thought it all out, what to do. I'm going to do. And don't be too downhearted. I'm, I'm rather good at staying alive. You know what? We may be together for another six months, a year. There's no knowing. At the end, we're certain to be apart. And this is all important here. Do you realize how utterly alone we shall be? When once they get hold of us, there will be nothing, literally nothing, that either of us can do for the other. If I confess, they shoot you. And if I refuse to confess, they'll shoot you just the same. Nothing that I can do or say or stop myself from saying will put off your death for as much as five minutes. Neither of us will even know whether the other is alive or dead. We shall be utterly without power of any kind. The one thing that matters is that we shouldn't betray one another. That's important. The one thing that matters is that we shouldn't betray one another. Although even that can't make the slightest difference. Well, if you mean confessing, we shall do that right enough. Everybody always confesses. You can't help it. They torture you. I don't mean confessing. Confession is not betrayal. 
What you say or do doesn't matter. Important, only feelings matter. If they could make me stop loving you, that would be the real betrayal. She thought it over. Well, they can't do that. It's the one thing they can't do. They can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you. No. No, that's quite true. They can't get inside you. If you can feel that staying human is worthwhile, even when it can't have any result, whatever, you've beaten them. This is so important because they can beat you. They can deflate you. They'll make you confess to everything. They'll make you say and do anything and everything. But if I can hold on to the way I feel about you, if I can hold on to the way that I love you and you love me, and they'll make us say and do whatever, but inside we still love each other, we win. We survive. And they could kill us and torture us. And now they, Wait a minute, so if they die, they still win? In a way, they've beaten the party, haven't they? I don't know. It sounds like a lose-lose if they kill me. I understand that. They're not alive. But couldn't you make the argument that Winston's not alive right now? These last 40 or 80 pages, yes, he's been alive and loving life with Julia. But really, is he really alive? Only the proles are the ones who are really alive, if you think about it. Okay? And so this is important. They'll make us, you know, he says, let's break up now and maybe we'll survive a little longer. Look, you're pretty, you're, you'll be smart, stay away from people like me and you'll be fine. No, we're going to keep doing this. Oh, wow. They're going to get us. I just know it. They're going to get us. And when they do, they're going to break us. But if we can hold on to our feelings for each other, we will win. And so it's almost like an oath, an agreement is made between them. Um, and it's pretty significant. So that's an important, important section. Um, on 167, facts at any rate could not be kept hidden. They could be tracked down by inquiry. They could be squeezed out of you by torture. But if the object was not to stay alive, but to stay human. Because when you're tortured, you usually say, I'll say whatever you want. Stop hurting me. Don't kill me. I'll say or do whatever you want. The motivation there is to stay alive. What Winston says here is, if the, uh, but if the object was not to stay alive, but to stay human, what difference did it ultimately make? They could not alter your feelings. And no, going into the torture, knowing you're going to die or knowing that they'll break you and do whatever. But if you can stay human and keep your feelings, you win. And Big Brother cannot, seems to be the only thing Big Brother can't change. Okay? And so that's important to remember. Okay, um, page 167. Part 8, or Part 2, Chapter 8. We have the big O'Brien meeting. Okay? Um, they had done it. They had done it at last at the bottom. Merely to walk into such a place needed an effort of the nerve. It was only on very rare occasions that one saw inside the dwelling places of the inner party or even penetrated into the quarter of the town where they lived. The whole atmosphere of the huge block of flats the richness and spaciousness of everything, the unfamiliar smells of good food and good tobacco, servants. This is a whole different world from what Winston's accustomed to. This is the inner party. The inner party got it good, don't they? The food, the smell, the cigarettes at the end, the wine, servants to bring you. I mean, Winston, uh, the lifts, the elevators that go up and down swiftly and fastly. Remember page one? His elevator don't move, does it? It's like Big Bang Theory. That thing just sits there. And they have to walk up the steps and down the steps, those of you that have seen it. It's the same type of thing, but here, everything works. Everything's nice. Everything's clean. The hallway is intimidating and clean in and of itself. He can't remember ever a hallway that wasn't all grimy and dirty from people being pressed up against it. And so it's completely different and completely intimidating. If that wasn't intimidating enough, on page 169, they walk in, Julian Winston walk into O'Brien's room, his office, he's working on something. He sets that down, walks over to the telescreen, and click, turns it off. You think that blew Winston's mind? Do you? Because Winston, up until now, he shared those glances with O'Brien. O'Brien had told him to come over and we'll look at the new, you know, wink, wink, the new... <clears throat> We'll come, and, we'll come and look at the new Newspeak Dictionary. And there seems to be a code going between them that hopefully this is actually about the brotherhood. 
That's what he's really crossing his fingers hoping for. And him turning that off. You can turn that off? Yes, we can turn that off. The inner party can turn that off. But only for a short period of time. We don't want to arouse suspicion. Okay? At the very bottom, they're getting ready to begin. And O'Brien goes, well, shall I say it or will you? I'll say it, said Winston. That thing is really turned off? Yes, yes, we're alone. Okay. We've come here because... Do I step off that cliff now? This is Winston's thought. Do I, do I tell him? This is it. This is why we're here. Because if this guy is not about the brotherhood, this isn't going to go very well. And so it's almost like uh, in the Indiana Jones and, and the Last Crusade, you know, right before the Holy Grail, he has to step off into blackness and only faith will save him, but he doesn't know that there's a hidden walkway. Those are the scene that know what I'm talking about. But oh, you have to take that step, that leap of faith. We believe, we believe that there is some kind of conspiracy, some kind of secret organization working against the party and that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. We disbelieve in the principles of Ingsoc. We are dark criminals and we are also adulterers. And he goes on and on and on. He feels the door open up behind him. For a split second, it'd be like, oh, great, they came to get me. But he turns and sees that it's O'Brien's servant. Oh, don't worry, Winston, Julia. Martin's one of us. Martin, come over here and sit down. You're not working right now. And so Martin sits. So he's part of this. Okay? Martin is one of us. Um, 171, before O'Brien really even says anything, he brings out some wine. And this is the first clue that O'Brien is actually what Winston hopes that he is. I think it's fitting that we should begin by drinking a health to our leader, to, not big brother, Emmanuel Goldstein. That's the first utterance that I'm able to find that confirms what Winston had hoped when they shared that glance, that he was something different, that he was part of the, um, the uprising and so on. Okay, now we find out more about the brotherhood. Then there is such a person as Goldstein? Yes, there is such a person and he's alive. Where? I do not know. And the conspiracy, the organization, is it real? It is not simply an invention of the thought police? No, it's real. The brotherhood, we call it. He looked at his wrist, 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 watch, wrist watch. It is unwise even for members of the inner party to turn off the telescreen for more than a half hour, meaning we don't have too much time to answer your questions. We've got a job to do. Okay, I need to ask you some questions and so on. So at the very bottom, you will understand that I must start by asking you certain questions in general terms. Mainly, what are you, what are you willing to do? Okay, here's a little information about O'Brien that I kind of find interesting. If you look on this next page. For a moment, the lids flitted down over his eyes as he's getting set. He began asking his questions in a low, expressionless voice as though this were a routine. A sort of catechism, kind of like, this is the initiation. This is the rite of passage to get into the brotherhood. And it, the routine, seems, he's done this a lot. He just, it just seemed that way. And so he goes, you're prepared to give your lives? You're prepared to commit murder? Acts of sabotage? Betray your country? Prepared to cheat, forge, steal? Throw acid in a child's face? You're prepared to lose your identity? You're prepared to commit suicide? You're prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again? No! Winston was just throwing out those yeses. Just like nothing. Get in a routine. Because they love each other. And they won't be, betray each other. They must stay together. So, he, Winston thinks for a moment. No, he said finally. You did well to tell me, said O'Brien. It is necessary for us to know everything. Then he shifts over to Julia. Do you understand that even if he survives, he may be as a different person, his looks... His personality, he might be changed from the inside out or from the outside in. Completely different. And you're okay with that? She murmured something that seemed to be a sense. So, something like, yes. Good. Then that is settled. And he gets out some cigarettes. And that, uh, the, that ritual, that rite of passage, that catechism, that routine, it's done. That's all he needed to know. Okay. Uh, page 174. He says, uh, later I'm going to send you a book. I'm going to send you... The book. The book without a title. Okay. Take some time to read it. They figure out what kind of... Not, I, I almost said book bag. What kind of uh, 
suitcase, what kind of briefcase, that's a better word, eh? briefcase does Winston use so that they can do one of those bait and switches. Have you seen this before in a movie? Guy standing there with a briefcase at a truck stop, he sets it down, some guy walks right up next to him, has it over here, sets down the briefcase, picks up the other one and walks away, and then this guy picks up the now exchanged one and then walks away. It's a way to kind of covertly cloak and dagger exchange things back and forth. They'll do something very similar. Um, they say that, okay, it's time that we need to go. We need to break up, move away. You know, we find out a little bit more about the Brotherhood in that we don't know how many people are in the Brotherhood. You will never meet, have a big social gathering of it. Because if you get busted, you will confess that you know me and maybe Julia, and that's all you know. Maybe Martin, but you won't know the rest. And if we're all Brotherhood in here, we're all protected. We're all safe. It's a way to keep our numbers up. You understand what I mean? If you bust one person, ultimately you'll bust two or three as opposed to bringing down the whole organization. Pretty smart. Pretty smart. Um, one seventy-seven, top paragraph. Um, he says it's important we don't go out smelling like wine. You don't want to attract people. It's you guys should probably separate and, and leave separately so I can turn on my screen. You know, just kind of, we don't want to advertise that we were doing something we shouldn't be. And you party, mem or, yeah, you party members in your overalls probably aren't going to be having a good wine. So let's, let's figure these things out. Um, it was important, he said, not to go out smelling like wine. The lift attendants were very observant. As soon as the door had shut behind her, so she's left, um, he appeared to forget her existence. He took another pace or two up and down, then stopped. There are details to be settled, he said. I assume that you have a hiding place of some kind? Winston explained about the room above Mr. Chinington's shop. Good, that'll do. That'll be fine. I'll get you that book, and you've got to get back to me in two weeks. Uh, then they talk about the briefcase. Page 178, here is the, where the dream comes to fruition. They were silent for a moment. There are a couple of minutes before you need to go, said O'Brien. We shall meet again, if we do meet again. Winston looked up at him. In the place where there is no darkness? He said hesitantly. O'Brien nodded without appearance of surprise in the place where there is no darkness. Hmm. In the meantime, is there anything you wish to say before you leave? Any messages, any questions? Yes, I have one. This doesn't seem overly significant, but look at all of the, the, the positives in this scene for Winston. O'Brien is a member of the Brotherhood. There is an existence of Goldstein. It all, it's all real. The book's coming my way. There, place there is no darkness. That actually happened in my dream and it's coming to fruition again now. And then, hey, have you ever heard of a nursery rhyme? The Bells of St. Clement, da, 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 you know, that one that's been bugging him and Mr. Train and they can't figure out all of it. O'Brien actually knows the last couple words, the last couple lines. And you see that at the bottom. You knew the last line, said Winston. Yes, I knew the last line and now I'm afraid it's time for you to go. Page 179 at the top. At the door, Winston looked back but O'Brien seemed already to be in the process of putting him out of mind. He was waiting with his hand on the switch that controlled the telescreen. So it's almost like once Julia left, he, she was forgotten. And now Winston turns around, O'Brien's getting ready to turn it back on and get back to work. It's almost like they, they didn't even exist. And so that sets up him to get the book in the next chapter. Now, chapter 2.9, as I set up, was very long. The first section of 2.9 deals with hate week. A couple very important things happen in hate week. What's the most important thing, do you think? That, it, it's the reason it caused Winston to have so much work. Yes, Caitlin. Winston goes into detail where he was at a rally. And in the middle of the rally, this man was up there going on and on and on. A piece of paper was put in his hand, he's going, Eurasia, 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 East Asia, East Asia, East Asia is our enemy, East Asia. It switched just like that. Just like that. And it's not that, oh, now we have a new enemy. It's, we've always been at war with East Asia. Do we understand? Remember the thinking behind that? We're always at war with East Asia. And that's where Winston and everybody else had a lot of work to do. 
It's kind of like Word now. We can just go search and replace, search and find. So we could go and find, say, you know, in this book, you say, find all Eurasias and change it with East Asia. That would have made their job a lot easier. <laughs> but they didn't quite have that back then. Um, yeah, page 180. There was no admission that any change had taken place. And there was the, the, the demonstration on 181, so that's very important to keep track of. Um, the thing that impressed Winston in looking back was that the speaker had switched from one line to the other, actually in mid-sentence. Not only without a pause, but without even breaking his syntax, without even fluttering, without changing anything. Mid-sentence, mid-stream changed it. And that was pretty impressive. And he's like, huh, impressive. Um, now, the thing you got to remember is, this big demonstration, this big hate week, all of this stuff is being focused against Eurasia. Then all of a sudden it changes. But all of the posters don't change. All of the posters still say Eurasia, even though they are now our allies. How did the public explain that? Whose fault was it that all the posters are actually of our allies? Whose fault is it always? That's right. Goldstein. Ah! Sabotage! Goldstein! Goldstein did all this! Ugh. So not only do they have hate against their enemy, but they have somebody to blame it on. Goldstein. You see how that just kind of works itself and solves itself and solves this problem? Uh, Big Brother's problem of getting them to accept it? It's, huh, look who did that. Goldstein. 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 Um... Page 183, right in the middle, I, I highlighted this one line, right in the middle of that big paragraph. A deep and as it were secret sigh went through the department. A mighty deed which could never be mentioned had been achieved. So Winston and everybody else had finished. They put everything in the memory hall. Good job, guys. Good job. We did it. But you can't run around and tell people what you did. You know what I mean? But they know that they've just done an enormous, enormous undertaking. Um, Winston finally gets an opportunity to, to get some sleep. He runs back to the apartment. He reads the Bible. I call it the Bible. The book, okay, Brotherhood Bible, um, page 184 and 185, which is the belief of Goldstein and the, the following. Now, a lot of this stuff, especially the, the beliefs and so on, it should sound very familiar. It was set up in the exposition of part one where Winston was going on and on and, and letting us learn about this stuff. So some of the stuff might have started to become, um, you know, uh, you skimming through uh, here and there. But the bottom of 185 was pretty significant, okay, because it explains the three superpowers, okay. In your mind, I've always been like, well, I guess we associate with Winston, so I guess we are part of Oceana. But if you look at this map, you see that Oceana is actually much, much bigger than just America, okay? Um, not only is it South America and so on, but it's pretty much this whole, what we consider, what, the Western Hemisphere and so on. Um, you know, the bottom half of Africa, Australia, just this big area. Man, they should be dominating. Look at all that land. Well, it's not so much just about land. And especially, and if you didn't understand the policy on war, and the superpowers, you're going to want to spend more time with it. Um, but look at uh, Eurasia, the old enemy and current ally. Okay, the purple. Okay, um, you see the, that East Asia is just right here, a light green. Uh, there's a link on Moodle to be viewed here at school of this. I think it's blocked, but at home you can, you can look at this JPEG and so on. Um, but uh, the disputed, the light, uh, light yellow is the land that you know, is being fought. The war is happening on those grounds. And notice just right around the equator. Right around the equator. Okay? So that kind of helps paint a picture in my mind as to what is actually happening worldwide. Okay? So keep coming back to that if you need to. Um, it should help you out. So you can see how Oceania, you know, absorbed certain continents and certain countries. And Europe is all absorbed mostly with Russia. Okay? Um, so when we get to the policy, you know, Ingsoc is Oceania, but they have a kind of a play on the word Bolshevik, a Russian term, neo-Bolshevism, 
Bolshevism. We'll get there. And um, so that's the big purple. And um, the green over there with mostly the China uh, the, and the Orient and so on. Um, so just kind of breaking it down visually. Um, good. Page 186 and 187. Definitely go through these pages again if you were struggling or skimmed over these because it explains the Brotherhood's philosophy and conspiracy theories about the war. They say that all three superpowers are kind of like Oceania. Each one is very similar. And they are always fighting amongst themselves. They never fight for the actual advantage to overthrow. They never go extremely aggressive to try to be the ultimate champion because that could throw off the whole balance of everything. And the people that are the, like the inner party, they have it pretty good, don't they? Didn't we just see O'Brien's pad? It's got it going pretty good. Okay, pretty good. And they don't want to mess that up. Okay, and there are inner parties within the other cultures, and they don't want to have anything uh, change or anything at all. Um, couple lines here and there spread out. It's always the same war, no matter who you're taking on. Um, I find it interesting that Oceania always seems to have an ally. It's never double teamed against Oceania. Do you see how that's playing out? Look up at that list there. Oceania was allied with East Asia at the beginning of this novel. Now we're allied with Eurasia. Well, how come the Asias don't ally against Oceania? It's kind of interesting how that doesn't play out. Historically, has that ever happened before? Well, no. Because there's never been a change in who we're fighting or who we're allied against. We've always been at war with East Asia. See how that plays out? Okay, that, we almost have to have a form of double think. We're like, well, we really know what's going on. We're like Winston at this point. We've experienced this change that he talked about that happened four years ago. Maybe it's like the Olympics every four years. Every four years we're going to change it up. It just so happened that it came during hate week. Interesting. Um, they really don't put too much stock in the land that they're fighting over. They're not really fighting to expand their countries, okay? Um, that's, a lot of their slave labor comes from those warm equatorial countries. Um, so when you always hear the, you know, the flying fortresses or the men fighting in the Middle East or that type of thing or in Africa, that's what they're doing. Um, a lot of it's fighting for resources. Um, you know, if they were to conquer, it says in here, conquer another country or, or another superpower, that's just, we have to execute a bunch of people. That's a lot of work. We have to spend a lot of resources and people to go and, and cleanse, cl clean house, in essence. Okay? So they really don't have much uh, desire to advance. They're good with where they are at and shifting in powers amongst each other. Um, page 188, a couple key things. The primary aim of modern warfare is to use up the products of the machine without raising the general standard of living. They don't want to build up and make everybody wealthy and comfortable. They want to keep everybody oppressed. And so the purpose of war is to use up those resources to keep the people back home impoverished. Doesn't that sound maddening and ridiculous? This is Big Brother, um, excuse me, this is the Brotherhood's theory as to why the war is actually happening. And you can see why Big Brother would not really approve of this mindset and so on. Um, Good, good, good. One ninety three at the bottom. A lot of things. If you wanted to skim through her again, there are therefore two great problems which the party is concerned to solve. One is how to discover against his will what another human being is thinking. That's what they're trying to solve. And the other is how to kill several hundred million people in a few seconds without giving warning beforehand. While people, are, while people are at peace, they're loading up their atomic bombs and weapons and they're getting ready to have another assault. It's not like we're just sitting back having a good time. Well, it's peace time. People are getting aggressive and getting ready to hit that nuke button to go and kill the most amount of people possible. That's just how they do things. Whether we agree with it or not, it's just 
Big Brother doesn't seem to agree, or excuse me, the Brotherhood doesn't seem to agree with it. Um, 195, important, none of these three super states ever attempts any maneuver which involves the risk of serious defeat. When any large operation is undertaken, it is usually a surprise attack against an ally because they won't see it coming, will they? What if we just invaded Canada right now? You think they'd see that coming? Probably not. We'd probably be, be very successful with that invasion, right? And it's not just us being America. They wouldn't see it coming, okay? And we could take it out real quick, one would think, okay? Um, 196, this is interesting. War prisoners apart, the average citizen of Oceania never sets eyes on a citizen of either Eurasia or East Asia. And he's forbidden the knowledge of foreign language. If he were allowed contact with foreigners, he would discover that they are creatures similar to himself and that most of what he has been told about them is lies. The sealed world in which he lives would be broken and the fear, hatred, and self-righteousness righteousness on which is moral excuse me, on which his moral morale depends might evaporate. <clears throat> excuse me guys, a lot of reading today. Um, that's an important session because it shows you that even though we are at war with enemies, we are the same. You see this in movies sometimes, okay, where an enemy in the woods is getting ready to fire on the other enemy and they find out, you know, oh well, look, don't kill me, I have a, a wife and two kids and then the other guy, oh, I have a wife and two kids too and you find out that they are the same people. They're just on different sides and they don't want the party, they don't want that to happen. The very bottom of this page, under this lies a fact never mentioned aloud. The conditions of life in all three super states are very much the same. In Oceania, the prevailing philosophy is called Ingsoc. In Eurasia, it is called Neo-Bolshevism, so the Russian one. And in East Asia, it is called by a Chinese name, usually translated to death worship. Wow. Wow. You want to follow that one? But ultimately, that's what it does to people. Don't you see how that kind of does it to Winston? It's just called Ingsoc and everyone else. Um, so just tons and tons of information in this chapter, guys, in this book. And I know it's kind of tedious to get through and so on. Um, but it's very key to understanding the Brotherhood and Goldstein's philosophy. Because it is vastly op in opposition of the party. Okay, so that's very, very key and very important. Uh, Julia doesn't seem too excited. Hey, Julia, I got the book, I got the book. Oh, that's great, go ahead and read it to me. She ends up falling asleep <laughs> as he reads it um, and as he continues with the second uh, half of the book, the last, you know, 10 or 15 pages or so on. You know, page 214, it defines what doublethink actually is, which this is a lot of the stuff, the second half, a lot of it's the stuff that we already know because of Winston and the, and the earlier uh, exposition and so on. Uh, so tons of stuff um, leads us into 210, which is your part two, chapter 10, page 218. Uh, the setting here and the setting for the last time is the apartment, okay? That apartment that is that glass bubble around Winston, that protecting, that insulating. He can say what he wants, he can do what he wants, he can be what he wants. Uh, he and Julia. Um, you know, listening, uh, remember he has a new respect for the proles that we just found out, um, you know, previously about how he, you know, they are the, the true people that are human beings. Julia and I, we're not human beings. You know, with a party, we don't feel, we don't have all of this stuff, but you, the proles, they're the true human beings. And so he's almost envious of them. Um, there's, you know, the scene in here, he's just listening to the songs of the parole lady out on the street. Um, just soaking it all in. Okay, soaking it all in. Um, I don't think it's, because it's like Winston, why, well, why don't you just defect? Why don't you just run away? Why don't you just go and be a parole? Because I think he wants to. But that exit strategy just might not exist. That get out of jail free, that, I just, I'm done, and walk away. Have you seen in the movies when they say, uh, you know, they go, one last job, one last job, and then I'm out. I'm walking away. And usually they say, you can't walk away. You can't leave. You know too much. You know, that type of thing. Um, and I think that that's very similar to what uh, Winston is going through here. Um, 
the bottom of 220, the last time we really get to see Winston, you know, um, thinking about the, uh, the proles and such, he says that the proles were immortal. You could not doubt it when you looked at that valiant figure in the yard. In the end, their awakening would come. And so he kind of goes back to that, uh, that rebellious nature. Not necessarily that they're going to lead a huge revolt, but he says that awakening, that consciousness, it will come at some point. Who knows when? Okay? Who knows when it will, but it will. Uh, page 221. <clears throat> this is the big reveal, the big shock. Winston and Julia, remember they've said multiple times that we should just end it. We should just, you know, leave. Walk away. Don't see each other again and we'll survive a lot longer than we will together. And he says, you know, we're dead. We're ultimately caught. And she goes, we're dead. And then out of nowhere, this voice, you're dead. Almost machine, almost cold, almost mechanical, kind of a tinny um, sound. You are dead, said an iron voice behind them. They sprang apart. Winston's entrails seemed to have turned into ice. He could see the white all around the irises of her eyes, so her eyes got really big. Okay, uh, Her face had turned to milky yellow. The smear of rouge that was still on these cheekbones stood out sharply, almost as though unconnected with the skin beneath. You are dead, repeated the iron voice. It was behind the picture, breathed Julia. It was behind the picture, said the voice. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. Okay? And this is the big shock, the big reveal, because behind the picture was a telescreen. But wait a minute. Mr. Charrington said there are no telescreens. They're too expensive. Who is Mr. Charrington? He's a member of the Thought Police. And we see him walking up, being in control of it. Do you recall that moment that I, I was telling you to annotate in your book several chapters ago where Winston talks about how Charrington kind of just walks around his shop, kind of like, like a collector, leafing through his things? and not like a salesman trying to sell stuff? Does this start to make sense a little bit more? He's just doing the job. He's just running out the time. Now the moment that, that they say that there's a telescreen, if you're a Winston, don't you start thinking about, uh-oh, what have they seen? What have they heard? What do they have? That type of thing, right? But Winston knows he's hosed. If you think back to that moment, I think it was one point 1.9 when he got the apartment and they say there's no telescreens and then oh look at the picture and Mr. Charrington says oh it's it's fixed to the wall but I, I could take it down if you want kind of calling you know a bluffing because he no one's gonna make the old man take it down right because if he did what would we see telescreen a couple chapters ago when Julia is they're playing house remember at one time she let I think it was in that scene it was in the last couple of scenes. Um, Julia says, you know, maybe I'll, I'll take that down and I'll dust it. Don't you wish she would have now? And if you go back, you would find all of these little things, these little clues that, uh-oh. And so there's, they have to stand still. They have to, you know, not do anything. Um, and then the, <clears throat> excuse me, Winston says, the house, it's surrounded. Julia says, now they can see us. Now we can see you. The house is surrounded. The house is surrounded. He heard Julia snap her teeth together. I suppose we may as well say goodbye. You may as well say goodbye. I'm mean, almost in tip because they're whispering, they're cautious. But remember, Winston from the beginning said anything above a whisper, the telescreen can pick it up. Okay? And she's saying we might as well say goodbye because remember what they've said will happen to them when they're taken? Do you recall? Pulled apart. We won't know whether each other is alive or dead. They'll make us say and do everything. Do you remember what we want to hold out hope on, though? What are they going to hold on to? The feelings for each other. That's right. The love. Okay? They, if they make me betray you and betray our love, that is when Big Brother wins. Because they're going to make us say and do things that we don't mean, but it's just torture because the goal is to stay alive. But if we can hold on to that hope, we will survive and we will be victorious and so that's the goal so she goes I mean they know their life is over they know they're done and then she goes well I might as well say goodbye 
because this is going to be it. Um, and then another quite different voice, a thin cultivating voice which Winston had the impression of having heard before it struck in. And by the way, while we are on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed, here comes a chopper to chop off the head. The limerick, the rhyme for the church in the picture. Does this rhyme now have a greater meaning for us? Here comes a chopper to chop off I mean, you, you guys are hosed. You're done. And it's all connected to the picture that's hiding a telescreen up there. And so it's just these little things are falling into place very neatly um, and so on. Page 223, men started coming in. Uh, violently, you know, punching and beating people and dragging Julia out. And he says, that's the last time I saw her, which probably isn't the, the, the perfect image that, you know, two lovers would like to have, seeing one pulled out. You can imagine in a movie now, they'd probably be ripped out by their hair and pulled on the ground, right? You've seen that vision before. Um, but someone had picked up the glass paperweight from the table and smashed it into pieces on the heath stone. So picked up his coral in the glass and smashed it. Remember how we had a metaphor for that being Winston being protected within the room? Can you see how that smashing is the same as what's happening present time? Okay, His glass world is being shattered. And he's just being discarded and broken and thrown down. And so not only was that glass thing demolished, but his real world metaphor of the world and the apartment and the protection that he had was demolished and smashed all in the same moment. Okay, So if you had problems connecting those two elements throughout the novel, um, definitely pay attention to that there. Um, yeah, they carried her out of the room like a sack, you know, just flinging her over and so on. He said that that was the last he saw of her. And at the bottom, he wondered whether they got Mr. Charrington. I wonder if they got him. Then the next page, there was another lighter step in the past as Mr. Charrington came into the room. The demeanor of the black uniformed men suddenly became more subdued. Something had also changed in Mr. Charrington's appearance. His eye fell on the fragments of the glass paperweight. Pick up those pieces, he said sharply, and a man stooped to obey. The accent, the cockney accent, had disappeared. Winston suddenly realized whose voice it was that he had heard a few moments ago on the telescreen. And then his appearance and everything had changed and he was a member of the Thought Police. And so he was being observed all along. Do you recall the, uh, the first time we see Winston in Prole District and he walks in, oh, hey, I'm right here at the shop where I bought that diary. And he walks in. Well, do you remember what Mr. Charrington said to him? Do you remember? I recognized you on the pavement. You came and bought that diary. You here for more stuff? And remember I mentioned that, wow, he was recognized. And Winston tends to try to want to blend in, but this man recognized him. This man probably start keeps tabs. Huh, interesting. Party member down here, wonder what he's doing. Oh, a diary. <laughs> okay, well, that's probably not going to be good things. Keep notes, keep notes. Keep records, keep records, and all of that. Everything that happened in the room, you think he was watching? Think he was listening? You think he was taking notes? Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Oh, wow, he brought a little girlfriend with him. Well, there's somebody else that we can add to the list. We didn't have this girl. What's her name? Julia. We didn't have Julia on the list before. Boy, she really slipped through our cracks before. I wonder how she did that. Well, we know because she had a really good cover, right? People ask, why didn't they pick him up sooner? Why didn't they pick him up sooner when, they, when he bought the book the first time? Well, you let this play out, and he starts condemning himself. Look at all the things that he does and says in that room that if they busted him from the beginning, they wouldn't have necessarily found out. They wouldn't have found out the depth with which he truly believed and truly hated uh, Big Brother and so on. If they busted him sooner, would they have gotten Julia? Not in this sting, but maybe eventually. Okay. Anybody surprised Winston got picked up? Anybody hopeful? that he was going to get away. But we still have a third part, right? But Winston, and, and I've been reiterating, Winston has told us from the start, well, that's it, they're gonna get me. 
It might be now, it might be down the road, it might be years from now, but once you commit it, they're going to get you. Even when he met O'Brien in O'Brien's house, he goes, well, we know where this is going to end. I took those steps, that, that subconscious thought, opening the book, doing the actions, and now it's going to end in the ministry of love. I just know it. And we commented on, wow, he's pretty pessimistic. You, we want him to be more happy, more, yeah, we're going to bring him down and everything. But this is, we should not have been surprised because we listened to what Winston was telling us. But it, I think it's our wanting the good guy to, to prevail and win. And, and, you know, he hasn't necessarily been defeated. He's just been caught. Okay? Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't look too good. Too good for Winston. Okay?